Welcome friends. I'm Chris. I'm the executive director of Bright Stars of Bethlehem. And at Bright Stars, our mission is to increase awareness and support for Dar al Kalama University, the first and only university of arts and culture in all of Palestine. Our vision is that all of our Palestinian friends would have life and abundance. And at Bright Stars, we have a motto, and that is hope is what we do. And today we're going to dive into you uh, really making that motto come alive by di diving into authentic travel and uh, and how that exemplifies hope in action and how it connects to empowering the next generation of creative leaders in Palestine. During our time together, you are going to have an opportunity to interact with amazing world changers. We have five panelists that are out of this world uh, amazing. I think this is going to be our best webinar yet. So um, you might have some questions. I hope you do. And uh, feel free to, during the time that we're talking together with the panelists, go ahead and ask those questions and then they'll be ready for the Q&A time. So um, hopefully your questions can be answered. Um, you know, we, we got a lot to, to uh, talk about here today. So I think it's good that we just get started. Um, we're gonna get started with our first panelist who is the co-founder of Bright Stars of Bethlehem. He's the founder of Dar al Kalama University the recipient of many esteemed international peace and justice awards, the author and contributor to over 40 books, a Lutheran pastor, the most widely published Palestinian theologian in the world, my colleague and friend, literal world changer. I'm honored to introduce Reverend Dr. Mitri Wahed. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, uh, Good evening, good morning, uh, friends. Uh, I'm so excited uh, to see many of you joining us for this uh, exciting webinar uh, on a very special topic, which is authentic tourism. And I guess uh, many people might uh, ask, what is authentic tourism? What is that? Um, I tell you uh, what it is in few words. You know, we were uh, watching a tourist coming to visit the Holy Land. Uh, and we noticed that uh, most of them are running where Jesus walked. Basically, they were going from one archaeological site to the other, from one shrine to the other, from one church to the other. And we felt uh, this cannot be really uh, what tourism should be. And then add to that, uh, when they were coming to visit uh, the West Bank, they would come only to Bethlehem for two hours. They quickly uh, zip into the uh, Church of the Nativity and out, uh, maybe go to a souvenir shop, uh, and that was it. Uh, they don't leave anything actually uh, in Bethlehem, and they don't meet the people. And as a theologian, uh, I was always telling the people, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not there. He is risen. And if he is risen, then he is to be found among his people. And, and so uh, in early 90s, uh, we started developing the idea that uh, to change the whole tourism pattern in the Holy Land, from running where Jesus walked to meeting the people, uh, enjoying the culture, uh, enjoying the food, uh, and uh, really tuning into the hopes and fears of all the years uh, that are here in Palestine so densely to be found. Uh, and uh, we found out at that time that uh, at that time there were 4,000 uh, uh, recognized and accredited tour guides. All of them were Jewish Israeli. There were only 60 Palestinians, which really meant that all, all the tourists coming were really just hearing the one side of the story, the one narrative. They were not really acquainted uh, and didn't have a chance to hear from the Palestinians firsthand and to meet with Palestinian Christians and to worship with them and to have 
a real fellowship. And this is important because uh, uh, Palestine, uh, tourism is very important for us. Uh, it's the main income uh, uh, revenue for Palestine. And for Bethlehem, 70% actually of our um, uh, tourism industry, uh, of our industry in general is connected to tourism. And now, especially during COVID, we, we, we were hit uh, really badly. Many, many, all hotels were closed uh, and uh, restaurants were closed. Uh, people lost their income and we thought we need to do uh, something uh, uh, about it. And so we started developing a new uh, a kind of tourism, including a cultural tourism, because so far all the tourists coming to Palestine are mainly religious tourism and we would like to diversify the tourism industry so more people will have income, but also people will enjoy and uh, see uh, our culture uh, here. We started this 1992. And one of the first uh, person uh, to work with me on that and then to run this program was uh, my colleague Rana Kuri. Uh, Rana, uh, welcome on this webinar. Thank you. Uh, Rana actually uh, just you. came back uh, from Harvard uh, after spending one year there uh, as uh, uh, Harvard fellow. Uh, and um, Rana, welcome. Maybe it would be good first to Tell us something, you were the first uh, uh, team member, staff member to start with us uh, many, many years ago. So tell us about these beginnings, but tell us first about Harper. How was that? <laughs> well, thank you, Mitri. So good to, uh, to see everyone. Uh, yeah, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, uh, it allowed for uh, what we've been doing the last 25 years as an organization. Uh, to sort of uh, focus on really what the driving force behind everything, which is Sumud, and that's perseverance. And I'm working on it as an indigenous uh, lived philosophy of Palestinians uh, who are challenged every day by different systems of oppression and how to basically not only survive, but thrive, which is our, uh, uh, our uh, uh, philosophy at Dar al -Kalina and how we communicate it to all the young people and the generations to come uh, of Palestinians. So that was a really, really a valuable uh, experience and time at Harvard. Uh, it was good to see that Harvard newsletter picked you and uh, <laughs> actually had an interview with you and told your story. Uh, so we are proud of uh, uh, what you are doing, uh, Rana. Uh, and. Uh, I think I'm uh, really proud that you survived with me all of these years. <laughs> I am, uh, no, it has been what an experience. And uh, when you speak about the beginnings of the authentic tourism, it is so you, Mitri, because it really reflects your personality and how you look at things. Uh, always the motto for us was hospitality is our spirituality. And so it did not come by coincidence that we have focused on this amazing program as a first program. We started in 92 by building the first thing that would attract, but also you always said, whenever I, I face a challenge, I start a project. And during that time in 92, aside from the fact that thousands of tourists would not come through, it was the fact that it was at the height of the first uprising where a lot of uh, uh, oppression and violence has happened on the streets. And you chose to build the first guest house uh, here uh, in, the, uh, in the oldest part of the city uh, and received justice-oriented groups to know more about the situation. 
And uh, this is how the roots of authentic tourism, basically people started coming to, and we continue to provide this sort of experiences where people uh, listen and uh, hear and interact with uh, uh, personal narratives. So the story that was printed in the newsletter of Harvard, this was not an exception. Actually, that's the story of so many Palestinians of what we're doing here on this land uh, since our presence uh, uh, continued, continued presence thousands of years. And basically people get to experience the uh, living uh, uh, present day culture and spirituality, uh, engage in, uh, in, in different ministries of hope, uh, and it is collective in nature. Our work is collective in the sense that it is not owned by a private uh, uh, company. Uh, uh, you speak about uh, sharing and uh, uh, all groups who come through uh, get to visit and meet and interact and uh, 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 give back. Uh, empowering again young people in employment as we will hear soon about Nira. So, and, and uh, uh, interestingly, uh, the work, the authentic tourism concept was so unique in that in four years from 92 to 96, uh, it was a, a culminated in a, a prize that it was as, first organ as an organization in the Middle East, we were the first organization in the Middle East to win this Todo uh, 96 award, uh, which is for socially responsible tourism, where actually 23 organizations from 17 countries competed. And uh, DAC, back then Darin Nedway, actually in four years managed to win a first, the first prize. This is a testimony of the work. And it doesn't stop every and year. Yeah. It doesn't stop. Every year we provide unique new programs, new people, new stories, new uh, uh, personal and uh, collective. Uh, yeah. And actually, uh, this award was uh, uh, given to us at the ITB, which is uh, the largest uh, tourism fair in the world, which takes place in Berlin, almost in Berlin uh, yes. every uh, March, uh, first week of March of every year. Uh, uh, so, uh, thinking back of uh, uh, of this beginning, um, did you ever think that uh, this uh, program will be so uh, uh, important that today maybe there are so many organizations in Palestine who have copied uh, this concept? Uh, did you think that this will be the case uh, back uh, in the mid 90s? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, it, it was such an innovative, unique idea. Uh, uh, just uh, similar to all other programs, our programs at uh, Dar al Kalima, but I actually did not anticipate the overwhelming. I mean, this program and the fact that so many other organizations copied it under the name alternative tourism and and actually impacted thousands of new uh, people and uh, it 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 managed to really uh, uh, we have managed to in 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 very humble way i say altered the face of tourism in palestine because tourists no longer uh, 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 those especially who are uh, interested in, and that's a lot of new tourists who are interested to meet the people and not just to go to sites and, as you said, uh, look for the living among the dead. They're interested to know more about the situation, about meeting people, uh, talk to people and so on. The, the, the tourist itself, himself or herself are more sophisticated. And so uh, uh, we have, I think, uh, have successfully managed to uh, plant the seed for so many others to follow by uh, uh, recognizing and following uh, and adhering to a socially responsible kind of tourism, benefiting everyone and not to maintain it in the hands of only very few. Um, and um, I know uh, there are always new ideas. So that was in the mid nineties uh, when we started uh, training uh, tour guides. Today, there are over 500 uh, Palestinian uh, guides, not 60. They tell the Palestinian narrative. They share their culture. 
A lot of them are women as well. That was a very new idea when we introduced it. No uh, woman that, was ever a guide in Palestine. Uh, th that was a major uh, breakthrough indeed. Um, but we always keep uh, developing new ideas. Uh, and so you are working now on a brand new ideas. Uh, yes. We don't want to spoil the idea, but maybe you can tell <laughs> us a bit about uh, what we are planning. I mean, uh, uh, I'll just say very few words, but it is, uh, it is uh, Palestine food stories, it's called. And basically uh, trying now to get the traveler and the visitor to be motivated to come to Palestine because most come for religious maybe or faith-based, but now the driving force would be the food. And Palestinian food is really special. Uh, and uh, to be, because food also has its own stories. It has its own legacy, it has its own heritage and, and it's, it has its own um, uh, impact. And therefore we are building now uh, new ways of how, because tourists come to Palestine, they come through us and they have food experiences. They may cook a meal, they may share a meal, they have a taste of something. But th we are talking about now the sole motivation for visiting Palestine would be driven by uh, uh, food uh, and uh, uh, meeting with primary and secondary uh, 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 food uh, producers, farmers, marginalized communities that I am sure so many would never meet and such a beautiful, beautiful also um, um, side to Palestine. Uh, thank you, Rana. I think we are excited to come, especially that, uh, as many of you know, we are also training uh, uh, people in culinary art. So we are training chefs for Palestine. Uh, we are uh, building right now uh, a state of the art, a new uh, hospitality educational center uh, that people can hopefully enjoy. Uh, so next year, if you come, uh, uh, friends, uh, you will be able to sit uh, hopefully on that uh, under that dome uh, with uh, 360 degree visibility. You can see the Dead Sea, you can see the Judean Desert, you can see Jerusalem, you can see the old city of Bethlehem. Uh, it will not rotate, but if you take uh, a triple scotch, it might start to rotate. But uh, you know, I, I think uh, the, uh, it will be stunning just uh, to be there. And then uh, there is uh, a training restaurant where people also can, uh, on different stations, cook with our students yes. uh, Palestinian recipes, uh, grandma's recipes from Palestine. So stay tuned, uh, contact us if you are interested in this program, uh, and uh, we will keep you posted. And I think really what, from my experience, I, I, I can say that people who came with us on such trip, their life was changed forever. And one person whose life was changed is our friend uh, and board member, Linda Edens. Uh, Linda, uh, welcome. Thank you, Mitri. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, tell us, uh, Maybe something first about uh, yourself. How was your life changed through a trip? Oh, um, wow. There we are. That, that was one of the things that changed my life, right in that picture. And you will, you will see a number of pictures as, as I talk um, of some of my authentic experiences. So um, I hope you enjoy those as you listen. But, um, you know, Mitri, the power of authentic travel was never made more apparent to me than on my first trip to Palestine. I always considered myself an educated, informed American, one who always tried to better understand um, a situation that maybe wasn't always clear. But upon returning from Palestine, I felt I was not given the clear story um, of the Palestinians by the US news and media, and only really by visiting and meeting the people did I learn. So it was then that I made a commitment that um, 
personally and then now with my work um, on the board to I wanted to share what I saw. I wanted to share about who I met, what I learned, um, and what I experienced. And so that kind of kicked off um, the travel emphasis with, with the Bright Stars Board. So, so, so how would you describe the connection between authentic tourism and Bright Stars of Bethlehem? Well, we created the task force um, to emphasize travel mainly because Simply put, the power of travel is in its offering a diverse, rich look into people and the culture of a land. So now as the board liaison for travel, I consider myself a resource um, for possible travelers. I hope to assist travelers to create a more meaningful experiential trip to Palestine or if they're if they're hoping to visit the Holy Land. Um, as you said, you know, we want to move people from just seeing the sites to meeting the people. Um, clearly, travel is one of the most powerful tools for learning about others in the world. And um, I think Rick Steves would even agree with that. Uh, and why do you think it is important, you know, for Americans to do this kind of tourism and not, you know, the, the, the average tourism. Yeah, well, you know, Mitri, so many Americans have a trip to the Holy Land on their bucket list. But as you said, they limit their focus to visit the dead stones, you know, that might be the churches built upon churches, the archaeological sites. Um, you know, the paths where Jesus walked. And, and that's incredibly important to this land. But it's the living stones, it's the people of Palestine that I hope trips will spend time with, um, experiencing culture, hearing their stories, witnessing their love. Um, we want to move past people going in the back road to Bethlehem, zipping in and out of the Church of the Nativity, and and rather staying talking to the people enjoying their food their language their culture um mainly for me you know the occupation palestinians live under creates a 24 7 dire situation yet i've never met a stronger more resilient more loving people and through the power of authentic travel tourists can experience this as well um, we hope also that, you know, the travelers can meet the students of Dar al Kalama, witness the good that's coming out of that university, um, the talent and, and the strength of those young adults. And then they return home, understanding just how important the work of Bright Stars of Bethlehem really is. And I know, Linda, you have been working hard uh, in the last uh, few months, uh, developing some resources. Uh, um, maybe you can share with us a bit to how to find these resources. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Bright Stars as a whole redid our website, which gave me an opportunity to have a section put on that website for travel. Um, there are uh, a number of different documents and things that I've created along with you, Mitri, um, for, for travelers either in the first stages of planning a trip or in preparation for a trip that's soon to come. Um, just to give an example, there's uh, a brochure that just kind of generally talks about things to think about that has lots of links to either contacting me, contacting Bright Stars, contacting um, uh, a, a website that I'll talk about um, soon that, that will help our university. There's a best practices document um, where we would love people to uh, spend time in Bethlehem, stay overnight, visit the churches, meet the people, eat the food, learn about the language. And of course, for Bright Stars on that best practices document also is, is a trip to the university. We have a document, a handout that covers just about every frequently asked question you could imagine, um, from weather to food to sites to clothing to security to safety to COVID. Um, we have a recommended reading and viewing document, um, which includes films, uh, books, 
uh, videos to prepare for a trip. Uh, for example, some groups have asked me for a book suggestion to do a book study before a trip uh, to kind of prepare, or perhaps they just returned back and, and they'd like to delve a little bit deeper. So there's, there's some possibilities for that on that list. And uh, talking about books, Linda, uh, there is uh, a program uh, called Books for Bethlehem. Yes, there uh, is. Can you share maybe one sentence uh, before... I'd love on. to. I'd love to. Um, you know, this is our old suitcase ministry for some of our Bright Stars friends, um, but it's an easy but powerful way to support the university's library by bringing much needed resources um, over in your suitcase when you come to visit. And it's, it's a simple but powerful um, way to do it. All you do is go on the Amazon website, uh, go to the wish list, wish list tab, and look at Daryl Kalama's wish list, order what you'd like to bring over to the university and have it shipped to you. Uh, then you pack it in your suitcase and bring it on over when you come to visit the library. And then you can know that you too are uh, joining with us to empower this next generation of leaders. It's, it's, um, it's very helpful, very needed, and, and an easy way for, for groups to participate. Uh, Linda, thank you for all what you do. Uh, you are doing this uh, all on voluntary basis. Uh, people can reach out to you uh, with their question, uh, uh, looking for advice, uh, and I know how much time that takes from you, uh, but we really appreciate, uh, you know, this enthusiasm, this passion uh, that you have for travel and for uh, Dar al Kalim. Thank you, Mitri. Thank you. I'd now like to uh, bring Chris back up on uh, the webinar, and she has a special guest that she'll be interviewing. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Mitri and Rana. You know, I have to say that um, I've been at Bright Stars for two years and um, a little over two years, and it wasn't until March of this, past, of this year that I was able to actually visit and do some authentic travel in my mind. And I have to say that my um, most compelling and beautiful moments at in Palestine were with the students at Dar al University. So right now it's my honor and my privilege to introduce our next panelist who is an effervescent, intelligent, wonderful young lady who represents the next generation of creative leaders mm -hmm. And that's Mira Alibi. Welcome, Mira. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me. Nice to see you. Thanks for being here. So, Mir, I'd like to just start off by asking you to tell us a little bit about yourself and your family. And um, please share. So, so, I'm 20 years old. I was born in Canada and I grew up in Palestine. I have one brother and my mother runs a tour company. And my father is a tour guide. And that's sort of how my passion for tour guiding started. That's wonderful. Oh my gosh, these pictures are adorable. <laughs> I always like to ask the students to bring their baby pictures on because this is just so precious. You, uh, you know, just one girl looking at the stars, shooting, having her wishes. There you go. Having See, hope. Relevance having hope. With our Kalama. That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, okay, so you've got a brother and um, mom and dad, and your mom and dad run a tour company. Yes, um, my father, yeah, my father is a tour guide and, you know, I wanted to study tour guiding because I used to, when I was a little kid, watch him on tours, you know, telling people about the reality of Palestine, showing them the sites, the historical, religious, cultural sites. And I was like, yeah, I want to be that person. I want to be that tour guide. And awesome. when I was a little kid, I kept dreaming about that until I went to Dar al that's wonderful. So it started at a young age. So who uh, was there a person in your life that when when it came time for you to go to the university, how did you find Dar al Kalama? Was there somebody that told you about it? Yeah. So my father's colleague, his name is Mustafa Al Araj. He graduated from Dar al Kalima, and after I finished grade twelve, he was like, "Do you know what you want to study?" I'm like, 
yeah, I've known my whole life that I wanted to be a tour guide and it's like my passion. He's like, okay, I'm not gonna say anything. You're just, I'm just gonna recommend you to go to Dar al-Kalima. You're gonna thank me. He was like, you're gonna thank me. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna try. <laughs> So I went to Dar al and actually like, you know, when you first go in, it's like hope and home and, you know, the teachers are amazing. And I actually thanked him. I'm like, yeah. You did Dar thank him in the end. Yeah, Dar al awesome. was exactly more than what I imagined. It was a great recommendation. Still yeah. One moment or one memory, um, like in the university with friends that you remember that you cherish, because again, you gra you're a graduate. You graduated yes. in I graduated last year, okay. uh, tourism. Okay. So yeah. any, any memories that you can think of that really uh, strike you as something that are special? Yeah, I have a few memories. Like the first memory was like when we used to come out of class and go to the cafeteria and the students there were like on their guitars singing, you know, like the vibe, the home vibe. Uh, the warm vibe as well. So like we used to sit, sing with them, you know, I cherish that memory. Other memories were like me, as you guys can see here, I'm going on guiding trips with my friends and looking at each other being like, yeah, one day we're gonna become those tour guides. We're gonna become, we're gonna show people the sites here. So yeah, those are amazing right. memories. And you really persevered, I think, during COVID because your time, your two years. Yeah, were yeah, it was, it was, it was hard because, yeah, because I, we couldn't like go to school, obviously locked down. We couldn't go to university locked down. So um, I had to like, but the best part of the, with Dar al Kilima, they made online easy. And after COVID, like when we started, like we can go uh, places and sites, they made it easy and we went to, trips and it was like amazing so that's yeah. great and so again i i noticed something about you because we had a chance to talk the other day that you are very resilient and um the samud that uh rana was talking about the perseverance in action that really strikes me i i had a, a question occurred to me about your being a tour guide um in palestine um i know you were born in canada so yeah. throughout, there are certain um, different things you can and can't do as a Palestinian, which is a, which is a, you know, because of the occupation. So question for you, can you, uh, could you be a tour guide in, and take people into Jerusalem? If you want? I actually cannot, unfortunately, because of the occupation, I have to have a special permit to go in Israel, Jerusalem. So I cannot, and my father as well, he cannot do that. Even though he's been a tour guide for how many years? Like, for decades? 12 years. 12. Okay, 12 years. And so he has to hire somebody else to, to that has the right permit. Yeah, the people who are in there and are allowed to go. And okay. that's, yeah. yeah, that's tough. But again, you're it resilient. Is. And you, you know, I, we have hope. We have hope. Have creative <laughs> resistance, for sure. <laughs> so, um, so how are you using your, um, your DAK education now? What are your hopes? I, it has helped me with my current job, like, you know, uh, the knowledge that I have from Dar al Kalima, it has helped me at the moment a lot. Uh, and so, uh, what would you like to do someday? When we talked the other day, you know, I asked about your dreams. Um, uh, again, something else that struck me was what you said about how you want to interact with other humans in this world. Yeah, and I want to make a difference in this world. Like, you know, if I have hope, I like to give people hope and say, yeah, hold on to hope because one day everything will be okay. We're all going to get our dreams. We're all going to fulfill our dreams. It's going to take time, but we got this. Let's just hold on to hope. <laughs> it's wonderful to hear and to see your upper best and smile is amazing. Um, so some of the folks that are watching right now, you are donors. Some are new friends. Um, I just want to say that Mira is just an example of um, just a shining example of the hope that exists at Daral Kalama and that exists in the hearts of our students that that um, get this very special education there. So, and I would love Mira. to thank you guys, and I would like to thank the donors of Bright Stars, and I would love to thank Daral Kalima for the hope and everything that they have given me. The yeah, so thank you. Oh, 
help. Thank you, Mira. Thank Thanks for, for being me. with us. And we absolutely are going to keep in touch and follow your story with our donors too. So. Of course. Thank you. Okay. We have got our next panelist coming up, which many of you have, have been anxiously awaiting. Um, this is also a world changer. He's a beloved American travel writer, author, activist, television personality. His travel philosophy encourages people to explore less touristy areas or of destinations and to become immersed in the local people's way of life, which is very much in line with what uh, we've been talking about with authentic travel. He's a dear friend of Mitri's and of Bright Stars, and he really gets it about turning hope into action through authentic travel. I'm honored to welcome Rick Steves. Hi, Rick. Thank you, Chris. Nice to be with you. It's such an inspiration to hear all of these great voices to, to celebrate the mission of Dar el Kalima. So um, I guess uh, I just want to talk and share about my impressions on, on, uh, on the work of Dar el Kalima and the work of Dr. Uh, Mitri Raheb. It is so exciting to be inspiring travelers to actually have what we're calling authentic tourism. And uh, I had authentic tourism. I'm a good example of that uh, uh, from my visit to the Holy Land. For, for years, I went to the Holy Land uh, and really didn't take it seriously. And then later in my career, I went with the um, intention of, of actually connecting and, and learning and um, contributing to peace with justice. And I had a great experience. And I just stumbled into um, uh, Dr. Mitri's uh, work in Bethlehem and was really inspired. So it's just great to be with you right now. And I think I'll show uh, a slideshow here just to give you some ideas of uh, what we're talking about here. And I'll be talking as a uh, tour guide in Europe, inspired by this whole idea that tourism can be a vital force for peace. I've known that for so long. And when every time I go to the Holy Land, I just think there's got to be somebody in Palestine to do this. And that's exactly what Mitri Rahab and his team at Dar al Kalima are doing right now with the notion of authentic tourism. Uh, my company used to be called Europe Through the Back Door. Now it's called Rick Steves Europe. But the whole philosophy of Europe Through the Back Door is connecting with people. As Mitri said, uh, run where Jesus walked. We're running where Jesus walked, and we need to walk. We need to meet the people. It's people that distinguishes a good trip. So um, this is uh, just for a little uh, primer. Here we have uh, Israel and Palestine, and there's 12 million people there. Half of them are roughly half of them are Arabs and Muslims, and roughly half of them are Israelis and Jews. In Palestine itself, in the West Bank anyways, there are 4 million people. Um, and then in Israel, you've got 8 million people. And uh, what we want to do when we go to the Holy Land is to remember you need to hear both narratives. So um, I went there a few years ago with our TV crew and made a one-hour TV show. And the whole idea was to humanize the people on both sides of that wall, to understand if there's a wall, if you don't know people and talk to people on both sides of that wall, you cannot understand that wall. So we produced a one hour TV show. And by the way, you can watch the show if you're curious anytime for free, you can stream it. Uh, if you go to my website and look in the TV corner, just look for the show on, on the Holy Land. Uh, but it all seems to revolve around this uh, very important piece of real estate here, which has the Dome of the Rock on it. And it happens to be about the most holy place on earth, as close as you can get to God on earth for the three great monotheistic religions, uh, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. So uh, I, God had a sense of humor, uh, <laughs> I guess, to put everybody's holy spot right there. Uh, but maybe it's a, a challenge for us to work things out and to communicate with each other. That's how I see it. And as has been mentioned, and what inspired Alinda and, uh, and, and so many people that support Bright Stars of Bethlehem, is so many well-meaning Christ Christian travelers go to the Holy Land and they go up to the Sea of Galilee to walk where Jesus walked and so on. And that's great. But when it comes, and, and if you're going to, I noticed if you're going to see one traffic jam among tourists anywhere in the Holy Land, it's there up in Galilee where all the buses are and all the tourists seem to be. Um, fine and dandy. And of course, on their bucket list is a trip to Bethlehem to see where it's believed Jesus was born to go into the church of the nativity. And they do that and they line up and they kiss the stone where Jesus was born. And then they make a beeline right back through that protective wall and get back safe and sound into Israel. Uh, 
they totally miss the boat. They need to spend time in the West Bank. And that's what I was blessed to do. And I'm so thankful I did. We've been talking about the value of tour guides. Uh, these are my tour guides here for Israel and Palestine. And when you go to the Holy Land, it's, it's, it's pro-Israel, it's pro-Palestine with the understanding that giving dignity and freedom to Palestine is the best thing that could happen for Israel. And young people and tour guides on both sides of that wall understand that. And as travelers, I really believe we need to make an honest effort to hear both voices. So here we have my guides, Abi in Israel, a Jewish guide, and Kamal uh, in, from Palestine, who happens to be a Christian Palestinian. And I'm so pleased to hear there's so many guides now in Palestine. And it's important to remember, tourism is a big part of the economy. Talking about the difficulty, I mean, it's amazing to think that uh, Mira's father and Mira herself cannot go into Israel, cannot go into Jerusalem. Uh, Kamal here and Adi live, uh, live just a few miles apart, but they can't go across that wall. In fact, it was really a challenge for us to find a place where Kamal and Abi could both park so I could go from one guide to the other as I ventured from Israel into Palestine. Have a local guide one way or another when you go into Palestine and have a focus of meeting the people. You can go into the settlements and meet Israeli kids. You can go into the streets of the villages and meet the Palestinian kids. And you can understand that there is a story on both sides. The Israeli narrative is, oh, a land without a people for a people without a land. Well, I mean, it's an exciting story for the people of Israel, but it's much more complicated than that. Of course, there were people on that land. And when they came, they displaced a lot of people. And we have to acknowledge that truth. And then you go into Palestine and you find people who just, just as a, as a baby shouts for joy, they shout, welcome to Palestine. To think that people can just say the word Palestine and wave the flag. To me, it just... It makes my endorphins do little happy flip-flops. And as a travel writer, I'm so tuned into the media reality. Here in the United States, it's a tough media reality. And we need to be mindful of that. I made a TV show which was very balanced. And it would not air in New York City because of who is powerful in controlling the media. They wouldn't run the show. I talked to the programmer. And he said, I can't run. We're friends, the programmer and me of the station in New York. We couldn't run the show. I wrote an editorial about Palestine and the Los, uh, many newspapers ran it. The editor down in, at the Los Angeles Times said, as long as you have the word Palestine in your editorial, we cannot put it in the newspaper. That's pretty difficult media environment for us to have an honest discussion about this. But here in America, we have to be practical and pragmatic about that if we're gonna get traction. So I work very hard to work within those parameters, knowing that the truth will prevail. And the more people we can get to go to Israel, the better. The more people we can get to go to Israel with, a, with an honest interest in seeing a balanced look at both Israel and the West Bank. Here we have a pretty graphic view of how Palestinian territory has shrunk in our own lifetimes. Uh, and it's smaller and smaller. And even in the West Bank, it's not all Palestinian. Most of the West Bank is not controlled by Palestinians. There are islands, enclaves that Palestinians control, but it is a very difficult and complicated situation. When we travel in Israel, we get caught up in the struggles and the challenge of the Israeli people. And if you're there on Independence Day, everybody's having barbecues and it's a real festival. Independence for Israel, yes, but there's a wall. And behind that wall are 4 million Palestinian people. And on the day of independence for Israel, it's also a special day in Palestine. And I believe it's called the day of catastrophe. It is a tough history. And when we go to the Holy Land, we'll stand on the high ground and hear Israelis say how they need the high ground. And we'll also go into the West Bank and we'll see gated communities, which are Israeli and Jewish communities, gated communities on the hilltops and then the Palestinian reality outside of those gates. It is critical that we talk to people. It is critical that they talk to us. When we venture out of our comfort zone and as Americans, when we go to places, we may not be encouraged by our government and our culture to go. 
we humanize ourselves and we humanize people who are supposed to be our enemies and it makes it tougher for their propaganda to demonize us and it makes it tougher for our propaganda to demonize them tourism thoughtful tourism authentic tourism is a powerful force force for peace and as we know there can be no peace without real justice traveling around you get to see how people live how people have their security concerns, how if you see a, a, an apartment flat with a bunch of water tanks on the roof, you know it's an apartment flat owned by Palestinians who don't have control of the water because Israel has control of the water. So they have to collect water on the roof. So when the water is turned off, they can still measure out that water and not go thirsty. We can see the complexity of the land. Bethlehem, Oh, little town of Bethlehem is not a little town, and it's not just a Christian town. You'll see lots of spires, and on those spires, you'll see crosses, and you'll see crescents. It's a mix of Christian and Muslim cultures. And of course, when we go to Bethlehem, we want to see the church, the nativity, but walk through the town, go to the commercial center. You'll see a, a humble monument on the main square. And if you look at that monument, you see a reminder that there are a lot of Palestinians doing hard time in Israeli prisons, young Palestinians who are put in a position where they need to fight for dignity and freedom for their families. I'll never forget going into a little computer like an internet cafe and i was this you know compassionate concerned american traveler and i went in there and i uh, you know made friends with the kids and i said salam and one little boy looked at me and he said f you rich man he said it a little more coarsely than that but f you rich man and i thought my goodness that is the reality that is the reality their reality is a reality hungry for hope. And it's easy for young people in Palestine not to have hope. And it's a tough reality. And what I am so inspired by the work of Dr. Dr. Mitri and Dar El Kalima and Bright Stars of Bethlehem is the mission, the underlying mission is giving the next generation hope so they can get a good education, so they can share their culture as tour guides, so they can have a reason to be invested in a community that's going to thrive. There's a hard reality and there's lots of opportunity for hope. The land, when you travel, you understand the love of that land where for 2000 years, Palestinians have worked and planted their olive trees, the communities, the thriving markets. There's so much to see in Palestine. But I want to remind you, when you're as an American traveler and you think of the, the rough edges of Palestine, it's analogous, I think, to San Diego and Tijuana. Uh, there's a tenfold difference in the, in the average income for people in San Diego to compared to if you go a couple of miles south over the border into, into Tijuana, 10 times. In Israel and Palestine, it's the same thing. If the average income in Israel is $30,000 a year, the average income in Palestine is $3,000 a year. When you cross the border, you realize that there's a harsh economic reality, and that's something we can work in uh, interest of uh, justice and peace and stability to rectify. The complexity of the history and the cultures is just amazing. When you go to Hebron, there's the tomb of Abraham, the common patriarch of the Jewish and the Muslim people from 4,000 years ago. And what's striking about this tomb is it has bulletproof glass halfway down the tomb of the uh, prophet Abraham. And on its one roof, and on one half of the building is a synagogue where, where is Jewish, uh, Jewish people come and worship. And on the other half of the building, it's a mosque where Muslims come and worship. Talk about poignant to be there and to think of the heartache and the bloodshed and the challenges and the, and the discord and how we can make a difference when we travel and when we support Dar al Kalama and the work of Dr. Mitri. This is an exciting opportunity. Again, when you go there, you see the reality of people who have to walk through these turnstiles every day and deal with soldiers every day just to go to the market and to walk around the block because this street is blocked off. And you see the joy of people who just wanna have their flag, who just wanna say, welcome, to Palestine. Welcome to Palestine. We are welcome to Palestine. And I'm just so committed to the value of travel being a vital force for peace. And that kind of peace is peace with justice. I want to remind you, 
when Israel built that wall, it did it to help make its land safer in their perspective. But an unintended consequence of that wall is that it keeps the young people on both sides of that wall unable to talk to each other, saddled with their parents' fears, their parents' baggage, and their parents' insistence on their culture. When young people get together and can talk and share, they realize they have much more in common and they have a practical interest in getting to know each other and giving each other a little wiggle room and guaranteeing each other the security they deserve and understanding that if there's not dignity on both sides of that wall, there can be no real peace. We're accustomed to hearing about Israel and celebrating Israel. But I think what Dar el Kalama is able to help us do is to celebrate the people of Palestine and to look at the young people of Palestine and understand that that's the future and we need to give them hope and we need to give them a basis and we need to give them support so they can succeed and there can be true peace in the Middle East. Peace that recognizes the deep roots of those cultures and peace that understands that we have lots to enjoy and experience together. And we can do that through travel and we can do that. And I'm gonna do that today by continuing to support Dar el Salema through Bright Stars of Bethlehem. Uh, that's just my, my thoughts. On, on the mission here. And it's so nice to be with you all today and uh, to, to celebrate the work of Dr. Mitri and Dar El Kalima. Thank you so much, Rick. That was wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Hmm. Now we're gonna take the time to answer a few questions. So Mitri, if you wonder any more. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Rick. Um, it was really a pleasure uh, to welcome you in Bethlehem. Uh, and hope to see you back here. Uh, but I guess we will see you first uh, in October uh, on the West Coast. Uh, Chris will tell us more about that exciting uh, event. Uh, we have many questions. Uh, we cannot take all of them because of time, but I will uh, take a few. There is a question about um, uh, visiting refugee camps. Uh, and uh, how important that is. Uh, do we recommend this? Uh, uh, and Rana, uh, maybe you can uh, address this issue because uh, we are doing that. So can you maybe share a few sentences about uh, visiting refugee camps? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, uh, the program is... Uh, uh, I mean, the question of refugees and Palestinian refugees is essential to presenting the story and the narrative of Palestinians. Uh, and, and therefore, yes, it's always included. And of course, uh, not to be uh, guided by a guide into the refugee camp, but actually we have cultivated as DAC so many good relations within the community, including in the refugee camps, so that actually representative from the refugee camp meet and take for a tour and so on and so forth, to answer questions and get into dialogue and so on. So yes, um, and so many other um, um, uh, issues and concepts and uh, organizations and communities. Uh, uh, yes, the program is, is uh, and, and it is not a program. The programs that we do is not like, uh, you know, you print out and you just uh, go on and uh, you get uh, thousands of people just going through the program as if they're running where Jesus has walked. Rather, it's actually customized. So a group, mm -hmm. for example, made out of teachers, uh, of course, their interest would be on education and so on and so forth. Or a group of uh, cultural activists, then the focus would be mainly to meet with uh, artists and so on and so forth. But for general uh, um, people who are just interested to be in Palestine and to visit, those programs are rich with the different components and including always a visit to a refugee camp for sure. And if I, uh, if so, I could add, if I yeah, could add, um, excuse me, uh, Mitri, if I could add, that was one of the most powerful experiences for me was visiting a couple of refugee camps, but I would highly. Um, uh, recommend or remind people that you you're much better off with a guide who can give you a meaningful experience than having it on some kind of bucket list and just walking through it's so helpful to have a guide to get you connected with people and hear the real story behind what you're looking at right and actually uh, talking about refugee camps i mean 15 percent of our students uh, darul kalima 
uh, they come from these refugee camps and uh, going with them, uh, seeing the refugee camp through their eyes, hearing their story firsthand is much more powerful. In fact, one of our students, uh, he did, he's in the film program uh, with Samuel Jaffari. He did the film about uh, the Haitia refugee camp and about the life there because this is his home. Uh, and uh, that film is called Ambiance. And you can find actually the trailer of that film on YouTube. And that film won the third prize at Cannes Film Festival. Uh, and so, so imagine uh, actually when a, a young man from the refugee camp goes to Cannes and win a third prize there. Uh, this is the empowerment of the young people that Rick was talking about. And we would like people always to go uh, visit refugee camps, but as Rana said, with the people themselves. And there are actually amazing organizations in many of these refugees who are doing great work. Uh, uh, so yes, there is another question uh, I would like to take to talk, maybe Linda uh, can help us with. Uh, it talks about, is it like, uh, are uh, people hassled uh, with uh, Israeli forces if they take uh, books with them in suitcases. You did that, so you can, you can tell us of your experience. Right, well, first I want to say, oftentimes people will ask, well, why not just ship it directly instead of adding it to the weight of my luggage? Um, but unfortunately, Mitri, shipping books directly to Palestine, as you know, is not the best option. Often mail, and packages never arrive at their destination. So uh, the Books to Bethlehem program was, was uh, created to uh, allow these books and resources to get to the library. Now, I can only speak from my experience and from all of the conversations that I've had with many groups that have come over. And I have never heard of, of books on their way to Dar al Kalama being taken out on the way in. Um, the only time I've had concern personally with things in my suitcase is on my way out. And so frankly, I, I, I feel no, no fear of, of those books arriving at the university. Yeah, thank you. Actually, we didn't have any problem when people bringing it uh, in their suitcase, but if they send them uh, by post, they might arrive after six months often like my uh, my last book, the publisher sent me uh, uh, the author copies and the Israeli kept it at the uh, port for like three months. They wanted us to pay so much money. I said, I don't want it, send it back. So, uh, so that is why, you know, this books for Bethlehem is really important. Uh, we are running out of time, but there is at least one question to Rick Steve I would like to to take uh, the question says, I understand that there are close to 600 checkpoints and roadblocks in Palestine and between Palestine and Israel. Did you face any difficulty passing through any of them? And if yes, what did you do to pass through? You know, the, the roadblocks, uh, there's two kinds of cars, as you know, Metri, in Palestine, are de de determined by the color of the license plate. And if you have a green license plate, I believe you're a Palestinian car, and then you stop at the, at the checkpoints. If you have an Israeli car, you drive right through them. Uh, we were fortunate that we were traveling in a Palestinian car, but it was during a time when things were easy flow. Uh, but I understand it gets hard or it gets easy, depending on what the political environment is. We never had any trouble. I walked, in fact, I filmed walking across the, you know, I always say it's a, you could, I think on a bicycle, you could bike from where Jesus was born to where he was crucified in 20 minutes or something. But the people can't, who live in each of those places, can't get together. But a tourist can walk across that border very easily. Just again, like the border between Tijuana and San Diego, um, every morning, a lot of people from Palestine walk into Jerusalem to work, and then they walk home at night uh, because they're cheap labor and is in, in Israel and so on. As a TV producer and as a TV host, I walked across the border back and forth through the turnstiles six or eight times and the guard was just, yeah, go, go, it's okay, because I'm a tourist, so we can do that. But if you are a Palestinian, 
that's what that border is all focused in on. So I didn't have any trouble with any checkpoints. Um, thank you, um, uh, Rick, uh, Linda, uh, Rana, and uh, Mira. Uh, I think um, we owe you so much um, with the stories you brought. Um, and um, I think this is a blessing for Bright Stars, uh, isn't it, uh, Chris? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And I, speaking of Bright Stars, I'd like to share that um, there will be another dynamic duo of Mitri and Rick Steves uh, coming up on October 5th at in Rick's neck of the woods in Linwood, Washington at, at his church, Trinity Lutheran Church on October 5th. That evening will be a free event. So if any of our friends are watching now from that area, we'd love for you to join them then. Um, that's going to be a really dynamic uh, show and again, or a program and it, it, as well as free. Um, they'll be talking about some of the same topics and also talking about Bright Stars a little bit more. And that will be a fundraiser for Bright Stars. Um, I'd like to encourage all of you as well to join our virtual gala on October 1st. And that is, um, we will be having watch parties all over the country. We're hoping to get 20 watch parties started. We already have about seven. So if you're interested in hosting a watch party, that would just consist of inviting your friends into your home that, um, you know, within your network, if you're passionate about this cause and this important work, um, and then watching the, the, it's always fun to watch things together, right? Instead of by yourself in your home. We're all sick of this pandemic. We went, now that we can open up a little bit, we can watch together. Um, again, that's on October 1st at 7 p.m. It's a free event um, and you can register. You can even point your phone. I was, I, I'm not very techno savvy and I'm like, seriously, you can just point your phone at that um, QR code right now and you can register. That's true. That's the case. So if you want to register for that, you can do that. And um, I just wanted to just profoundly thank all of our panelists today. I do believe this might be our best webinar yet. We're always striving to get better. Um, so compelling, so interesting. And again, the stories are, you know, of, of, of amazing human beings that are, that are um, resilient and persevering, uh, especially our, our friends in Palestine. That's, that's where your heart gets connected. And I think we've got a lot of friends out there watching right now who, who know us and who are our friends who have been donating. We want to thank you. We want to thank you because what you're doing with your gifts, with your time, with your treasure, if you're volunteers, if you give financial gifts, you are helping students like Mira to um, flourish in this world. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Um, I also want to thank any new friends that have joined us today because we'd love to get you involved. If, from everybody, we, we could use prayer. Um, so please pray for us. But also we'd love to, for you to start um, giving to Bright Stars. We could use monthly gifts, uh, one-time gifts. Anything will help to fuel this important mission. Um, also, if you want to become an ambassador, which is an awesome network that we have across the country, um, give us an email and we'd love to get you connected. We have uh, ambassadors in several different states around the country um, that work towards um, uh, empowering the next generation of creative leaders in Palestine. So thank you all for joining us. And uh, we, we ask you to continue to do what you're doing to unlock hope. Take care and God bless.